Good afternoon and, and welcome to this UNU Wider webinar. My name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a senior research fellow here at UNU Wider in Helsinki. Um, and I'm very pleased to serve as chair this afternoon. So we're joined today by Brian Levy and Alan Hirsch, who will present on why good governance is not enough. Can South Africa meet the challenge of economic inclusion? And in their presentation, they'll help us to understand South Africa's path since the transition to democracy in 1994, as well as prospects for the future. What can be done to move South Africa onto a more tra inclusive trajectory? They build in their analysis on a really interesting framework that highlights the role of ideas and institutions alongside growth and inequality in these processes. Um, and in doing so, they, they shed light both on the South African experience, um, but, also on, but also draw lessons and insights for other countries embarking on similar reform processes. So these are topics and themes that figure strongly in our work here at UNU Wider, including my own. Uh, and we also at UNU Wider have particular interest in these issues in the South African context as part of our SA Tide program in support of inclusive economic development in South Africa. And so we're all really looking forward to the, the presentation and the discussion this afternoon. Our two speakers bring rich experience working on these topics. Um, and by way of very brief introduction, Brian Levy teaches at the School of Advanced International Studies, Johns Hopkins University. And he was the founding academic director of the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance, University of Cape Town. From 1989 to 2012, he worked at the World Bank and he's published widely on the interactions among institutions, political economy and development policy. Alan Hirsch is Emeritus Professor at the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance at UCT and founding director from 2011 to 2019. He's held a number of positions, both in academia and in government. Um, and in, from 2002, for instance, uh, he managed economic policy in the South African presidency, representing, represented the presidency at the G20 and was the co-chair of the G20 Development Working Group. He's currently, among other positions, a fellow at the Oxford Martin School at Oxford University. Um, without further ado, I'll move on in a moment to the presentations. Our speakers will present for about 35 minutes and then we will open the floor for questions. Um, and I would invite you in the audience to please think about questions as, they, as they're presenting um, and do feel free to raise questions during the presentation by entering them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And as time permits, we'll get to as many of these questions as we can. And I will also, if, if time permits, unmute a few of you to ask the questions live. So without uh, further ado, let me uh, turn over to our first speaker. Uh, Brian, it's over to you. Thank you, Rachel. Back in 1994, South Africa inspired us. It inspired us with its heroic struggle, with its um, it, visionary leadership, and its transition to constitutional democracy. Looking back with the lens of hindsight, two background conditions that shaped that transition loomed especially large. The first comprises the country's remarkably strong formal institutions. If you look at this slide, whether it's the rule of law, government effectiveness, control of corruption, on all three of these, South Africa's the measures of South African institutional quality resembled much more those of high income countries than the middle income country that it is. The second startling feature was the country's massive inequality, the extraordinarily large share of spending that went that made by the top 15% of the population and correspondingly the extraordinarily low share of spending that goes to the 40%, bottom 40% of the population. And these numbers are incredibly skewed, even compared with Brazil in the early 2000s, which was regarded at the time as the most unequal of the middle income countries. So what happens when strong institutions and massive inequalities collide? In this talk, Alan and I will 
offer our views, which we draw from a paper that we co-authored together with two colleagues from the University of Cape Town, Vino Naidu and Musa and Kele. And we will, as you can see, proceed in four parts. Let me begin by laying out the framework of the presentation. So the pre our framework has two key analytic building blocks. The first of these is an analysis of South Africa's political settlement. To cut a long story short, given the time that we have, I just want to make three overarching points about this slide. First, the central role in the South Africa's settlement of an idea, the idea that a society could move from zero sum or even negative sum conflict and actually cooperate and achieve gains for win-win. Second, the this idea, um, in a sense, a better life for all, is an idea that was crucial both for, both for the deals among elites in the society, and also it was key for the incorporation and hope among non-elites. Third, a key theme of our talk, as you'll see, is that what we have in this deal are some are credible commitments, but other parts of this deal are much more in the nature of aspirational. So this is the first aspect of the framework. The second analytic building block is a, we, we take from Albert Hirschman's classic analysis from his Latin American experience of a country's changing tolerance for inequality. And I wanna make four points about this Hirschman cycle. The first one is it's classic Hirschman. You begin with inclusive growth, imbalances build. These imbalances in turn can transform into anger and then you confront the challenge of renewal. The second feature implicit in Hirschman but central is that what drives the cycle is ideas. And this is true in two ways. First, if you look at the top right of this um, slide, the idea of hope turns to be key in as part of a virtuous spiral between hope, um, strong institutions and accelerating growth as mutually reinforcing one another. But second, as the quote at the left signals is that with disappointment, hope can all too readily turn to anger or as Hirschman puts it, non-realization of the expectation of the hope will at some point result in my becoming furious. So those are the two analytic building blocks. South Africa between 1994, to quote the title of a book that Alan wrote, um, was known as, was the period of the season of hope. And here you just see some of the gains. The gains were substantial. Absolute poverty with daily hunger declines sharply in the first 15 years. Um, the provision of social services and infrastructure expands rapidly across the society, society, a safety net is created through social grants and labor intensive public works. Accompanying this, and this is all happening against the backdrop of accelerating growth. As of the time of the transition, South Africa's economy was dead in the water. Slowly but steadily, growth accelerates. It never gets to East Asian um, rates, but it does get up to 5% per annum in the 2004 to 2008 period. But this is all happening against the backdrop of inequality. And as per our framework, um, unresolved distributional imbalances in South Africa create three sets of threats in particular, which would undermine this virtuous um, spiral that I described earlier. So the first threat, is this. Relative to other middle-income countries, South Africans were either rich or poor with very little in between. This is measuring the third ventile relative to the seventh ventile, 11th to 15th percentile relative to the 31st to the 35th. And as you can see in this graph, in South Africa, more than the other middle-income countries, there is a distributional cliff. The people are either affluent on the top side of that cliff or poor with very little in between. Second threat is the continued nature of the ethnic composition of the elites. So in 1995, 
the elite was very skewed, unsurprisingly, um, towards white South African, 71% of the top 10% of the population were white. But this persists to a strikingly troubling degree into 2010. So the, the white population is less than 10% of the total population, but it does account still for 56% of the um, most affluent 10%. Indeed, about 70% of white South Africans are in that top 10%. That's the second threat. The third threat is ideational. More than any place on earth, into the 1980s, South Africa was a place in which white supremacy was, um, was dominant. White supremacy and privilege was the law of the land into the 1980s. And as we've learned, and as the 2015 protests that are depicted in this slide remind us vividly, even after all kinds of profession, professions of non-racialism, internalized privilege can live on in the symbols of a society and in the hearts and minds of its citizens. And Ellen and I were both at the University of Cape Town during this period, and I think we both saw this as a salutary challenge to entrenched white privilege. But considering all three of these threats, it immediately becomes evident, and we highlight the vulnerable parts of it in the slide, it immediately becomes evident that indeed, the many of the commitments associated with the political settlement were aspirational, and they were aspirational commitments that could come unglued. And they could come unglued in two different ways. They could come unglued via despair, or they could come unglued via ethnopopulism. So let me say just a little bit about these, and then I will turn over to Alan. So first, um, let me talk about ethnopopulism. Um, the work by Sharon Mukand and Danny Roderick, I think is particularly powerful here. It highlights how <clears throat> ideational political entrepreneurs can work to manipulate worldviews and manipulate identities in order to try to drive voting in a direction which may even be inconsistent with economic interests. That a classic example of this actually is the quote that we have here at South Africa's economic freedom fighters, the notion of white monopoly capital. There's a worldview there as the source of poverty. And there's also an identity dimension associated with us. And so where ethnopopulism can lead us, it can lead us to declines in GDP, to major declines for established elites, to some decline for almost everybody else, and to large gains for new ethnopopulists. And to see what happened that's the one scenario. The second scenario is the possibility of slow, steady decay. No hope, no investment, no cooperation, and a rise in individual opportunism. To see how this plays out in practice, let me now turn over to Alan. Thanks, Brian. Um, and then one so, more click. oh yeah. So, we're now going to look at what happens as a result of um, the failure, really, to address the issues of inequality and the and the, and the declining confidence that results from that. What we can see here is that we're comparing South Africa's um, GDP growth rate with other middle-income countries and other upper-middle-income countries. Um, if you look, take a longer view than this, you can see that South Africa maintains a fairly constant relationship to those other, um, those other uh, comparators. But in the period since 2008, there's been a widening gap between them. And that's the critical thing in, the, in this, apart from the fact that you can see an overall decline in, GDP, in the rate of GDP growth to a point where it's generally been um, below the population growth rate. So it's been negative per capita GDP for the last six years until this year. Um, and unemployment for, for um, 16 to 24 year olds was extremely high. Um, youth in general, unemployment rate is extremely high. Unemployment for older members of the workforce was also high, not as high, but that's partly due to their withdrawal from the workforce. 
Um, so it's a technical outcome. There were several attempts to transform society into a society which was built on um, a inclusion both of the of the poor and of the elites. Um, the the poor, as as um, Brian has mentioned and may pick up later, um, the, the social grant program in South Africa has been more extensive than in most other developing countries, and by necessity it has to have been. Um, and there have been attempts to improve services for the poor, but among elites, um, there were several attempts to incorporate elites effectively as well. And one of them was the corporate strategy of the National Economic Development and Labor Council, which was a, which is a uh, a council which, with statutory force, um, it was one of the first laws of the new government, um, which brings labor, business, government, and uh, other members of the community together. But in fact, it's really a a meeting place of big labor and big business, and it has failed to be um, an effective um, foundation for a long-term social compact, unfortunately, up to this point. Um, whether it can be reconstituted in that form, because it did seem to be succeeding in the Mandela years, um, but after that it, 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 um, it failed and it became what, what a, one economist called this rambunctious tussle between elites for the surplus or for the rents. Um, another attempt has been black economic empowerment. We haven't spelt it out here, but it's black economic empowerment. Um, this started really as um, the white business class, this very powerful, um, very ol oligopolistic um, business class, um, making approaches um, black business people and drawing them into into business. It kind of echoed what happened in the 1940s and 1950s, even the 1960s, when the dominant English-speaking um, uh, capitalists drew in Afrikaners into the broader capitalist community very successfully in that case, less successfully in this case. Um, but there were various um, steps along the way, a, a BE commission, um, sectoral charters, there was a BE scorecard that tried to broaden the forms of economic empowerment beyond simply um, transferring ownership of large companies to a few uh, to a few connected um, members of the black elite. But in the end, it was relatively easy for opponents of government within the ANC and outside of the ANC to accuse the government of cronyism because of the way that BE worked out in practice. Um, another attempt, and relatively successful for a long time, to, to create a uh, more equality in, amongst the, in the middle class, among black and white people, was to draw um, more black people into the, into the public sector. Um, and I would say that for the first 15 years or so, it was a, it was a pretty successful um, process of drawing people who um, who wouldn't necessarily otherwise have been drawn into the organizations because of the organizational culture and various other reasons. And you had a, a very significant transformation, both in gender terms and in racial terms. Um, but when we moved into a more populist period, um, like um, Black economic empowerment, um, the transformation of the public sector became a vehicle for the distribution of patronage. <coughs> and, um, and this, and also the fact that appointments were made in the public sector for the wrong reasons, using transformation as, as a mask for, um, for basically engineering relationships in the public sector to favor certain certain people in the well basically the politicians and their allies in in the in the public sector um led to a deterioration a significant de deterioration in the quality of much of the public service um although you know brian will show later that it's not still not bad by developing country standards it's not as certainly not as good as it used to be it's probably felt most strongly in some municipalities in middle-sized towns the, so how did we get to this point? The ANC, as Brian has already said, was a, was a, was a, uh, is a broad tent. It, it 
was formed um, as, a, as an African nationalist organization, um, what could be called a sort of petty, petty bourgeois nationalist movement, except that it also had some traditional um, leader support as well. Um, it broadened in mass resistance campaigns in the 1950s and 60s, which were modeled on Gandhi's strategies in India, um, drew in trade unions, um, and black business constituencies were always a part of the ANC, um, although not all black business people were part of the ANC. Um, so it's, it's been a very uh, broad tent, and it's, 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 it's symbolized in some of the some of the policies and the uh, strategies of the, of the government reflecting the, the needs of the organization. Um, what happened as a result of um, the fact that the, the, the processes of incorporation, both of the elite and um, an improvement in the condition of the poor to a significant extent, because unemployment um, didn't ever get below 21 or 22%, it's now over 30% again, um, was this rampant, the sense of rampant unfairness. Um, this, this uh, even though, as you saw in Brian's um, present, first presentation, the economy was improving um, and jobs were actually being created, it wasn't fast enough and inequality wasn't being reduced fast enough. And a lot of support uh, came behind the populist leadership within the ANC, um, President Zuma, and um, this led to a significant shift in the orientation of government after the um, Polokwane um, conference in 2007. Um, what happened with the populist takeover was essentially that um, what uh, the the the, the, the um, transformation, um, economic transformation became a, and, and the challenge of greater equality became uh, to some extent um, a cover for um, capture of the organization um, by some of the political leadership and particularly by um, private, people in the private sector who, who were taking advantage of the vulnerability of this, of this populist government. And you had, for example, in the uh, state-owned enterprises, you had a, a predatory governance. Um, you had basically a reappointment of entire boards of state-owned enterprises. I was asked to leave a, a board, or actually two boards of state-owned enterprises in 2011, along with many, many other people, as we were replaced by people who were more compliant and appointed the right chief executives and made the right decisions about tenders in terms of the the requirements of the of the um, political leadership and their um, allies in the public sector, and those allies were global allies as well as uh, national. Um, we also had a um, significant changes in 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 key organisations, particularly in the in the um, criminal justice system. The National Prosecution Authority was. Uh, disemboweled effectively. The South African Revenue Service as well to allow for all kinds of practices to take place. The courts and parliament um, were not completely undermined and the fact that the courts weren't and the independent media and the public protector who is a statute, statutory person, um, the, um, a statutory position um, in terms of the constitution was, uh, was able to defend um, uh, the the constitution and that which is her, her in this case her job um, but unfortunately she was replaced in the middle of the Zuma era uh, by an, by another a public protector investigative journalists um, and even academics uh, doing a lot of investigation to support the journalists and various other people um, challenged uh, challenged the system but in some cases. Um, the uh, populists were successful in taking over major uh, um, journalistic organizations, which had very widespread um, readership or listenership or, or audience. Um, so 
what, what you do have um, is a significant de decay in the quality of governance, as I mentioned earlier. Um, it's decayed, uh, say, from 1996 to, to, to 2017 very significantly, um, although it's still above levels um, in Brazil, um, not necessarily, well, and similar to levels in, in Mexico. What is striking in, in these numbers is the, is the slight improvement in the governance numbers that happened after the takeover of Cyril Ramaphosa in, um, in 2018, effectively, as president. Now, the question is why? Why did, um, how was, was, was Ramaphosa able to take over? Well, firstly, I, I've talked about the resistance in civil society and some of the political society. But within the ANC, why, why was there a vote for reform, a movement away from, from um, the Zuma government? There were two factions, effectively, that supported uh, Ramaphosa. There was one group that actually wanted reform and a return to the um, much better quality of governance that had happened in previous governments. Um, and there was a group that feared the loss of power. And um, that group that feared the loss of power, you know, wasn't concerned about what the po politics or the policies of the of the government were. They only were concerned about access to um, government in order to have access to patronage um, pat patronage power. Um, so, if we look at what at the at the factions within the ANC, there's a group that supported the populists and the effective state capture. Um, there was a group that supported reform and those who um, were, were only concerned about power and the most powerful, and, then, and that leader who was most likely to help them to win elections um, held the balance of power effectively. And Ramaphosa was just in 2017 so that he could become president the next year. Now, we ended up in a, in a, in a, in a serious crisis in South Africa, what, what, are the, um, what are the responses? Well, you know, as Brian has, has indicated, um, we, we have to have a, a, a response to the, to the kind of inequality, both in terms of the inequality among the elites and the inequality um, between the, the, the rich and the poor, um, which is a, still a massive inequality. Um, so what we, what we weren't able to do beyond the initial transformation, beyond the transformation of the public sector and some very significant changes in gender composition in the private sector and the public sector, particularly initially, it didn't go very far. So if you look at the numbers, the number of, of black people in senior management in the private sector goes up and then it stabilizes in the 20% kind of area, 20 to 20, 20 to 30% area and it doesn't go higher. It seems to just reach a kind of a plateau. Um, so there's, there's not a sense, um, both amongst managers, amongst the poor, and amongst the, um, and amongst uh, private sector entrepreneurs themselves, that there's a real opportunity for them to, uh, to, to move upwards in society. There's a, there's a sense of desperation. There's a sense that something has, has to change. Um, so how do so how do we accelerate upward mobility? Um, well, there has to be improved governance, and that may be happening to some extent now, um, but very slowly. Um, and then we have to focus on the ladders of opportunity in the economy. We have to make sure that more people are employed in labor-intensive um, activities, and we have to focus on the on the supply side, make sure that more people are able to take advantage of a growing economy effectively. Um, now, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I've overset uh, my time a little bit, so I'm going to go very quickly through the last few slides. Um, there's, there's a lot of debate at the moment in South Africa. The, uh, perhaps the one good thing about the crisis that South Africa is in at the moment, a crisis of low growth and um, and a, a lack of confidence in the way forward is that there's a very widespread debate. Um, the response in terms of reform from the national treasury has been um, mainly structural reforms that don't cost too much. Um, modernizing network industries, everybody would agree with that. 
um, lowering barriers, uh, increasing competition, prioritizing labor intensive industries, um, implementing competitiveness oriented activities, harnessing regional growth, and so on. But that's not enough for um, a radical group, which includes um, a wide range from um, business to um, NGOs to trade unions and so on, who feel that there should be much more in the way of social transfers. And they also believe that many of them believe that a Keynesian injection in the economy would simulate growth, even though the current uh, debt rate is, is pretty high. The, the debt to GDP ratio is around 71% and, and is going up, although this year has been slightly better than before. Um, everybody believes that, yeah, I'm not gonna go into all the other details. I think, I think the key thing is to, to point out that there's, a, that there's a tussle really between conservatives and radicals at the moment over whether it's whether increasing debt um, and supporting uh, more social transfers is a way of both incorporating the poor and stimulating growth, or if it's going to reduce confidence because South Africa has traditionally been incredibly dependent on um, indirect uh, foreign investment in, in government bonds and in portfolios, and that confidence has been lost. And uh, the conservatives are worried that that confidence won't be regained if the debt gets higher. Um, clearly, what has to happen is that, um, well, uh, you know, I think we, we've tried to suggest some, not, in the, not so much in, in the paper, but um, the suggestion now would be that there has to be some sort of um, important inclusion of the poor, but there may be an inclusion of the poor through the extension of the COVID relief, social relief of distress grant, which has targeted the unemployed who don't receive any other social grants, um, and that a range of other initiatives should be put forward to, um, to support both economic growth and inclusion effectively. Um, a combination of stability mechanisms and, and inclusion mechanisms. Um, the NC suffered setbacks at yesterday's municipal election, but I think most particularly governance suffered a setback in that the, the participation, the voter participation rate has fallen from about 63% to about 47%, very serious uh, shift, I think, in South Africa. Um, does the president, President Ramaphosa, have time to, um, to implement the kind of reforms that he's trying to implement at the moment, or is he running out of time? Is the fact that the ANC support has also fallen in these current elections going to mean that Ramaphosa doesn't get enough, uh, doesn't get a second term if he continues with what has been a very incrementalist approach to reform, the right kind of reforms, but very slow? Um, should he act now? Or should you continue with his careful movement forward in the hope of getting a second term or being able to control the appointment of the next ANC leader? I'll hand back to Brian. Thank you, Alan. So let me just pull up my screen again. There we go. Um, so um, as I laid out in the first part of this talk, meeting the challenge of this turnaround and of inclusive development is not only about good policies. It also needs to be complemented by an ideational renewal. So in this last part of the presentation, I'm going to build on the earlier analysis and on Alan's comments in three ways. First, I'm going to unbundle this notion of an ideational renewal by the type of ideas. Second, I will focus on who the ideas influence, <clears throat> distinguishing, following the logic of the political settlement analysis, between established economic elites, private firms and their willingness to invest, emerging elites and their willingness to cooperate for shared national purpose, and non-elites, and how one might renew confidence in the possibility of upward mobility. And I will do all of that by looking at how policies and ideas might interact with one another. So with ideas, on the first of these, the role of ideas. It was actually John Maynard Keynes who underscored the centrality of ideas, specifically of expectations of the future in shaping private investment. As he put it, new fears and hopes will can without warning take charge of human conduct. And that he says is the key driver of private investment. 
And so what in South Africa are the major influences on ideas of what the future might hold? So on this, it's actually Francis Fukuyama who signals to us the central role of legitimacy, of perceived fairness in shaping expectations. So question arises, are fairness and legitimacy addressed in a good enough way by the reforms being considered and described by Alan? And then third, by ideas, it's actually game theory that signals the crucial difference that cooperation can make in shaping outcomes, zero sum, negative sum versus gains from cooperation. The two, two examples here, the classic example of the prisoner's dilemma, the example of the game of battle where you can have two good outcomes, but if you can't agree, you only get a, a zero sum outcome. And with this, I want to underscore how, how, in a sense, Hopefully, these interact, expectations and the idea of cooperation. Hopeful expectations lengthen time horizons that enhances incentives to cooperate. And longer time horizons, plus the enhanced incentive to cooperate, high, um, in, that strengthens leaders' ability to make and implement difficult decisions. So bringing together the ideas and the actors gives us these four elements private firms and their expectations, non-elites and their expectations, enhanced willingness to cooperate across elites and strengthened decision-making authority on the part of political leadership. Now, here's a sense of how this can become a, a virtuous spiral. Take, look at these three examples first, which are straightforward. How a positive expectations shift amongst non-elites, a positive expectations shift on the private sector and accelerate growth can be mutually reinforcing. That's the top um, line there. Then the vertical line um, between a growing economy and elite incentives to cooperate. Rapid growth creates more opportunity. Enhanced willingness to cooperate strengthens expectations. Then there's the bottom horizontal line between the elite willingness to cooperate and the decision making of leadership, which are again mutually reinforcing. From these, two more effects follow directly, the, namely that hope among non-elites strengthens leadership authority and strengthened leadership feels hope. That's the blue vertical line and how stronger strengthened decision-making authority on political leadership um, strengthens expectations. Now that might sound abstract, but in fact, if you reflect on it, you will see that it is precisely this shift in expectations that fueled South Africa's recovery in the 1990s and in the early 2000s. And we also saw its opposite in the mid and latter 2010s, how a shift in negative expectations can fuel the reversal and the downward spiral, which brings us to the key question as of November 2021, which is to what extent can, the, can policies initiate and sustain a renewed virtuous spiral? And as you see here, I list four sets of policies, and I will talk about each of them in turn briefly. First, the kinds of policies that Alan described, pro-growth policies and policies to foster upward mobility. The, this, it seems to me, is the South Africa's immediate challenge. The current discourse is focused on the details of these economic policies, but the kinds of policies under consideration will do little in the short term to shift expectations. And without the shift in expectations, the stagnation will remain. So that's the first fundamental challenge, how to do better than that. So there is a seemingly good solution. The seemingly good solution is um, strengthen and improve governance. But the dilemma is that's easy to say, but actually achieving gains in the short run, Alan Flagg, that the process has been slow, is been difficult and challenging. Now, I have some ideas, a central part of my own work, actually, and how one can achieve more rapid gains. Now is not the time to go into them de to detail. Otherwise, noticing that, again, I think it's a new kind of citizen engagement, civil society's mode of engaging, organized labor, established elites, government, which one which prioritizes win-win possibilities, looking for those mutual gains, um, is, I would argue, the key to shifting expectations and making a 
difference on governance in the short term. But that's not where South Africa is at this time. And this brings me to the fourth and last of the policy areas, which is what we a, a focus more centrally on growth compatible fairness and legitimacy. These potentially can have a large impact. They may have large potential to shift expectations, but this is why the lines are in brown in the slide, they also have the potential to backfire. One can easily imagine a set of policies that target fairness and legitimacy that don't that produce a sense of panic and continued and accelerated capital flight. So the question is how to get the gains from a focus on um, fairness and legitimacy while limiting the risks. Another critical question, another one where there's limited time. I just want to make three points in relation to this. The first one is we want to ask ourselves, what are ways of pressing for redress that are also growth compatible? Now, um, there are a number of different ways to do this. Flag some here. In my view, one that has enormous potential that I haven't seen explored much is, if you like, thinking about the integration between the third and the fourth one here. A poverty alleviating income support grant can, can and already has to some extent happened rapidly. The question is, might one transition that into an area which has emerged in a number of different societies, and perhaps South Africa can be in the, on the frontier of pushing it further, some version of linking that kind of grant to what we just, um, Atkinson has described as a, Anthony Atkinson as a capital endowment paid to all in adulthood, perhaps linked to the investment in human and physical capital. So there are, there are ideas here. In my view, the agenda that's pursuing these ideas remains rather narrow. So that's my, but then my third point that I want to make, you often hear South Africans say, is South Africa overtaxed? And I think there are two parts to the answer. One part of the answer is, if there's a deep and widespread perception that public finance is badly used, it's very difficult to achieve the legitimacy of taxation. But the other part of the answer is, in a highly unequal cap um, country, even if the aggregate moderate rates of tax are, aggregate rates of tax are moderate, they will look as if a disproportionate share of tax falls in the elites, because that's because a disproportionate share of wealth and income is in the elites. And if we actually look at South Africa's patterns of taxation relative to some others in some key areas, it, it is not out of line of many, many countries. So there, so the, these then are the options. And I want to summarize like this. Um, we know where South Africa is stuck. South Africa has been stuck. It's been caught in the stagnation that followed from the downward spiral. In my view, the agenda of policies that are now on the table are insufficiently bold to actually turn around that downward spiral. We potentially can see a way out, but getting there will take more boldness than South Af either South Africa's technocratic discourse or its non-populist political discourse has so far been able to muster. And so we will end there and we look forward to any reflections that you might have. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you both. Um, it's really a, a rich uh, presentation and it, it sparks uh, a lot. There's a lot of food for thought and also for action there. So it sparks a lot of thoughts for me. But I, I know that there are some really rich questions here in the chat. So I won't abuse my position as chair. Um, and I'm going to actually ask one of the first person who posed a question here, Adventino Banjwa, to um, unmute and, and ask his question live. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Rachel. Hi. Am I okay enough? We can hear you. Okay, thank you. My name is Adventino Banjwa. I'm a PhD fellow here at Makerere University. Uh, thank you, uh, our presenters, uh, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, my question emerges from the first half of the presentation concerning um, ethno-populism. Uh, and my question really is, uh, how should we make sense of ethno-populism? 
um, I get a sense that in a way, ethnopopulism speaks to the fragmented nature of the struggle uh, towards social economic inclusion. Um, uh, so I ask uh, our presenters uh, whether or not this really speaks to an incomplete political project, uh, which really means more work needs to be done on the political. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Brian or Alan, please go ahead. Yeah, let me say a little bit around that. The first critical point is to distinguish between the legitimate challenge to internalize notions of white privilege and the opportunistic character of ethnopopulism. Ethnopopulism, and we see it in many different countries, is and can be an opportunistic tactic on the part of certain elites to use and leverage cleavages in the society for gains that are rather narrow. So I want to make that distinction. Um, a society that is both has large racial cleavages and that is massively unequal with that inequality linked to those racial cleavages is, of course, vulnerable to that kind of ethnopopulism. And I do want to say that one of the su pleasant surprises to me of the municipal elections that have just been held is that the strongest ethnopopulists did not do very well. It's a remarkable feature of South Africa that notwithstanding that perhaps more than anywhere else in the world, those two cleaverages lend themselves to ethnopopulism, it has not taken hold. But I do want to say, um, um, Adventure, I agree with your basic point fundamentally. In the early 1990s, the promise of a better life for all and the political transformation seemed to be enough to inspire hope. That story has had its sell-by date. That story is done. And in a sense, if this underlying ethno-populist um, hazard is to genuinely be addressed, absolutely it needs a deeper political project. And that's what in different ways Alan and I, I think, tried to point to in the last part of the presentation. So thank you. Can I, can I just um, add a point, uh, you know, reflecting on the, the part of the question about the, the political struggle. And, you know, Mahmoud Mandani has recently brought out a book called Neither Settler Nor Native, where he carries forward some of some of his arguments. Um, and he's he's looking at the, the question of how do you move beyond racial identity between, between uh, how do you move beyond the definitions of insider, outsider, settler, um, colonized, and so on. And in, a, in his view, um, and he lived in South Africa during some of that period. He's the Ugandan um, political philosopher who's I think now at Columbia University. Um, he, he felt that the, 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 the political struggles in South Africa in the 1970s and 1980s, which we described, which I described earlier, looking at the trade unions, looking at the United Democratic Front, looking at the student movement, which I didn't mention, there was a, there was a real um, a movement in a way to a certain extent beyond race. Uh, Mahmoud Mamdani calls it the South Africa movement. And then that became um, enshrined in the form of the, the negotiations that took place before the transition, during the transition and the, and the constitution itself. Um, uh, and the, and, and the, there was this notion, you know, in the 1990s of a rainbow nation um, where, where identity wasn't as important as a common, as a common um, uh, commitment to a better life for all. Um, I think that, you know, Brian and I have discussed this briefly. I think that there's a lot of, there's a really interesting argument in what, what Mamdani says. I think one of the reasons that the ethnopopulists have not spread as widely as before is that there is some, you know, a remnant of the um, South Africa moment that has an impact on the way people think in society today, which gives me some optimism about the possibility of moving forward. Thank you. Um, so time always goes so fast. So we have about 10 more minutes and we have, um, we have a set of really interesting questions here from Bobby Jacobs. And I'm gonna ask him to unmute if he can. Um, and 
to please, he's posed a number of questions, but if he could please um, just raise one key question for our speakers. He's pushing back a bit uh, about um, the, the recommendations in terms of economic policy. So if, if I could just ask him to ask, to pose his, his one main question. Uh, thank you, Madam <laughs> Chair. Yes, and hello, I'm sorry. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the speakers for a really interesting topic. Um, and so I guess I think the question that I would like um, to be answered the most, given South Africa's history, is the issue around what is the alternative economic policy? So you guys focus a lot around um, the political stuff and the governance stuff, but Given the experience in the US around inequality and the fact that traditional economic policies do not does not address inequality. Um, so when you start out in a country like South Africa with high rates of inequality, the traditional economic approach was never going to address or close that inequality gap. And is there room for an alternative economic theory or economic ideas, like, for example, the circular economy or donut economics. And given the current climate crisis, is pursuing growth, which is what South Africa needs to create jobs and to address a series of, of social problems, at what cost? Do we continue to pursue growth? And where does addressing South Africa's climate needs balance with the economic policy for growth? Thank you. Thank was... you. So Alan or Brian, please go ahead. Um, let, let, let me start off. Um, you know, Bobby, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it's a if it's a I think that the that the economic policies um, haven't been successful, obviously, in in addressing inequality, both within the elite and um, between the elite and 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 the poor, um, and the and the the working poor and the, and the and the many unemployed. Um, and you know, we we do suggest um, a number of strategies um, that need to be adopted in relation to that. Um, they include. You know, more better targeted social transfers, um, better targeted economic development strategies to, to create jobs. Because the, I mean, any 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 analysis you look at, um, the the biggest cause of inequality in South Africa is unemployment. So jobs have to be created. Now, whether those jobs can be created without um, without a very high rate of economic growth that is environmentally damaging is a, is a very critical question. And you know it's very exciting that today um, a, 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 an announcement was made um, by the by the presidency about a um, a deal in which South Africa has committed to meeting the 2030 um, climate uh, change uh, targets in terms of emission reduction, which is a massive thing for South Africa, which is heavily dependent on coal for electrical power and for the transformation of many of its minerals, um, uh, and that that deal relates to uh, uh, various forms of finance that are are being offered by four um, developed countries uh, to support a just transition in South Africa. It, it, on paper, it's extremely exciting, and it does offer the possibility of a um, a form of economic growth that isn't going to undermine our climate targets. Just, just to add, um, I think Alan and I very much agree that the question of inclusion and ideas around redress and need at this time to be taken on more centrally. We both very much agree that there is both necessity and opportunity around green growth, green, the green economy. I think both of us would also argue strongly that Oh, that in a sense, there is no feasible narrative in South Africa that can address poverty, 
address inequality and, and address redress without also accelerated green growth. So the question is, can, can, can one move from these zero, I mean, so these, South Africans are good at zero sum dichotomies. You either think it should be equitable or you think there should be growth. Can you break through that and say, what are the opportunities? That's why we use this phrase of growth compatible redress. And absolutely, I think green growth compatible redress is an opportunity, but a version of getting to a viable, sustainable, long run, thriving future without growth. I think neither Adam nor I think that that's plausible. Thanks. Um, so we're almost at time and I wanted to just raise one final quick question and offer you the chance to give some closing remarks around the, um, what, what do you think about the implications of your work uh, for other contexts and other countries? It was one of the things I found very rich in your report is, is um, using the experience of South Africa to inform thinking about other countries. And I wonder if you have any final remarks on that and also any, any closing remarks in our last few minutes. Let, let me say something to that and then I'll leave the very final comments to Alan. Um, so, what I find helpful in terms of lessons for other countries, South Africa puts incredibly front and center the relationship between inequality and the emergence of to toxic populism. That topic is there. I'm actually involved in some comparative work right now, which is the United States world through a South African lens. And I think putting the South African story there makes it necessary in a way that Americans don't always do to come to grips with those that set of interactions. So I think it is key. I think what is remarkable about South Africa, and I, it's just, as Alan said, it's an amazing source of optimism in respect to that country, is that by comparison with other settings, when the provocation and the history to take those racial cleavages alongside the inequality cleavages and turn that into a toxic downward spiral of populism is so large. It's quite remarkable and a source of optimism that that in fact has not happened. So I think putting inequality front and center, center South Africa could lead and I wish that the policy discourse in South Africa took that more seriously, even with its various grants, but also the sense of one doesn't have to despair, this can turn. So I'll end there. Um, thanks, Rachel, for this opportunity to present the paper. I don't really have a lot, to, I don't have anything to add to, to what Brian said, except to say that um, you know, the paper that we did um, publish th um, through the Carnegie Endowment um, is available um, if people want to want to follow up and, and, and see some of the details of the arguments, which are much more in depth. I saw online, for example, there was a discussion about the, the public sector and the expansion of the managerial class within the public sector in the Zuma era. We, we examine that those sort of issues very, very carefully. Um, and we try to present this in a kind of balanced way, but we are at a very critical moment in our society. And I think the president and others in the elite must be weighing the, the questions very heavily at the moment. Um, what are the implications of this, this dramatic drop in confidence in the, uh, in the government that's partly, that's partly a result of our failure to um, combat COVID as quickly and effectively as we should have, and partly a result of many years of economic stagnation. Thanks, Rachel, and thank you to everybody else for your participation. Thank you so much, Brian and Alan. This has been really fascinating presentation and um, also really, really rich set of questions and, and responses. Um, so thank you very much. I encourage our audience to read the, the paper, um, which I think is on, on the Carnegie website. Um, and um, I think we need to bring the seminar, the webinar to a close now we're at time, but thank you very much uh, for, the, for your participation today.